BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Highlights from the quarterfinals. Catch up with today's master snooker in 40 minutes here on BBC Two after Mary Beard. Hello and welcome to Front Row Late. I'm Mary Beard and tonight I'm asking if beauty truly is in the eye of the beholder, can we ever actually agree what it means? A new exhibition explores the influence of 19th century art guru John Ruskin. But does a universal concept of beauty make any sense in a diverse society? We talk about a Botticelli or an antique Chinese vase as beautiful. Is it the same for fascist art or wind farms? And to explore ideals of female beauty and gender, I meet someone as unlike John Ruskin as you could imagine, drag queen and activist Panty Bliss. Welcome, everybody. Joining me to discuss all this are a trio of beautiful minds. <laughs> Historian David Olashoga, who, like me, is a veteran of the TV series Civilizations. Shahida Barry, who lectures on Romanticism at Queen Mary, University of London, and who's written on the philosophy of beauty. And the writer Simon Jenkins, who used to be chair of the National Trust, and I think it's fair to say is no lover of wind farms. <laughs> we also want to hear from you. Uh, what was the last thing that made you think, wow, that's beautiful? Tweet us. But I think I'm going to start by asking the same question to you people, right? David, if oh. you were tweeting, what would you tweet? Well, this week, the most beautiful thing I saw, I saw a heron in the lake outside the National Archives. That shows how boring historians are. There has to be something beautiful outside an archive conveniently <laughs> located for me to notice it, but it was rather wonderful. Simon. I, it's the weather. The weather. I found the weather beautiful. It was a <laughs> mist rising over the round pond in Kensington Gardens with the birds flying through it. It was sensational. Shida. I've been listening to an album... So less visual, more oral, because beauty can come at us in different ways. I've been listening to Sufjan Stevens, because I'm young and cool. But um, it's <laughs> and beautiful. no offence, Simon and David. But, you know, that kind of music is penetrating and beautiful in a different way. I'm going to, after that, you deserve this. <laughs> um, I'm going to stay with you. Um, and I, in order to give us a bit of a framework for this potentially vast discussion, um, I would like you to... Um, summarise for us um, thousands and thousands of pages of philosophical papers um, that have been written on beauty over two millennia. What, what are they actually on about? When we talk about beauty, what are we arguing about? Well, I can do it very quickly. Um, <laughs> the key, I think the key ideas about beauty, philosophically, um, are about the seriousness of beauty. So we talk very casually about beauty being in the eye of the beholder. And often we talk about very narrow conceptions, largely of female physical attractions when we talk about beauty. But philosophers for centuries have talked about beauty as a really serious, heavyweight concept. It has real gravitas. It's, you talk about the beautiful in the same breath that you talk about democracy and justice and ethics. It has real weight. So we've slightly lost that in our modern culture of, of talking about the beautiful. And the thing that happens to philosophy, certainly in the 18th century, I'm thinking about people like Burke and Kant, uh, a little bit earlier perhaps, that we they get derailed into arguments about whether, when we talk about something beautiful, whether the beautiful is about the properties of an object and it inheres in the thing. So Burke, for instance, says it's in small things, it's in smooth things, or whether it's something in us that we have the capacity to perceive beauty and they get totally derailed into quite thorny arguments about whether it's there in that thing or here in us. There's also uh, something about morality, isn't there, in all this? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we talk very casually about beauty. I was thinking about my neighbour who has a pug dog and they think their dog is beautiful. No offence to people who have pugs. Mm. And I don't find the smush nose very beautiful. But we never talked about beauty in that way, philosophically and historically. We talked about it like democracy, like justice, having an ethical gravitas and weight. So there is a kind of sense that 
in order for something to be beautiful, it also has to be morally good. Or it could be, or it could yeah. be part of a civic good, yeah. Yeah. Anything to add to that brilliant synopsis? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the problem, I think, with the growth of the idea of the individual and this deep respect for the individual in Western civilization, and the individual was then given this right to decide what's beautiful for him or herself. Uh, and, and, I mean, from, from Kant right through to Her Majesty's government, <laughs> they said, we decide what's beautiful for us and what's beautiful for you is in your own mind, and so, so to speak, get lost. So the word is dropping out of use. It's a deeply unfashionable word at the moment, beauty. It, it applies to makeup or it applies to really nothing. Um, but but, but I, uh, the, 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 to me, the essence of a civilization is it can have a conversation about beauty. And it's a conversation, precisely as, as, as you were saying, about the relationship between your awareness of it and the thing itself. And there is a conversation. It's not all in your head. David, do you think it's all in your head? Well, I think there are echoes of the seriousness of the concept of beauty philosophically in the fact that we don't talk about it. I think people think it's quite <clears throat> a statement. It's quite a bold statement to say something is or isn't beautiful. Mm. And I think people are nervous about doing that because it's attaching yourself to the judgment that you're making mm. and because there is that sort of echo of seriousness. that well, it's, it's not saying something pretty or something's... There are lots of kind of more frivolous words, but beauty is quite a statement to make. But, but, it, but I mean, I think it's very important because if, if you're standing on the top of the of the Cotswolds and looking out over a beautiful scene, and you say that is really beautiful, most people know what you're talking about. And 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 the problem is, somebody says, "Well, I want to build a bloody great power station in it," and you say, "No, you won't. It's beautiful." They say, "That's just your opinion. That's our problem." But I'm now going to take you back 150 years or so and get down to a, an example because there's a new exhibition opening in London uh, about. John Ruskin, you know, one of you know, the great 19th century uh, art critics and philosophers. Now, I think that the truth is now that a lot of people have heard of Ruskin um, and a lot of people know the probably completely erroneous anecdote about his wedding night when he was suppo supposedly... He saw for the first time his wife with no clothes on uh, and saw for the first time that she had, or any woman, had pubic hair and was so disgusted that the marriage was never consummated. Um, now, this is fake news, you it know is it. I know it's fake news. <laughs> yeah. of course it is. Great story. Good Great story. Yeah. Still a good That's story. That's what they say about fake news. It's always a good story. Yeah. Better story than real news. <laughs> but I think, you know, to be honest, um, most of us have not read much of Ruskin's you know, many long polemical works. But he remains, I think, uh, and this is the justification in a way for the exhibition, somebody whose legacy about what he had to say about beauty that still falls pretty heavily on us, I mean, I think, you know, particularly in terms of morality, isn't it? Well, my lasting memory of Ruskin is not just the story about Effie Gray's pubic care, which I think is a distraction, of course, <laughs> fake news or not. You but it's about his. We it. still keep mentioning it. <laughs> but he's so much more interesting on the relationship between beauty and civic good. So he talks so so beautifully about. He talks about buildings, mm. about housing, mm. about how people live, and the idea that beauty isn't just frivolous. It isn't something that belongs to connoisseurs in the way that it did to 18th century uh, people, gentlemen. It's not about um, luxury. It's not about um, aristocratic paintings. Beauty is... There's a gesture of equality in the fact that beauty is everybody's birthright, that everybody mm. deserves to live in a house that could be beautiful. But we're in some ways a kind of rather crude descendant of that view, um, particularly in, in examples such as, oh, let's think of... You know, Eric Gill, you know, a, a well-known man of, of you know, disgusting morals, we would now say, we'll not mention what they were, or even at 11.05 at night on the telly. Um, and that makes us r rather awkward about accepting Eric Gill's art as something we can admire. And in a sense, that, that juxtaposition of goodness I mean, it wasn't invented by Ruskin, it was invented by the ancient Greeks, if anybody. Mm. Um, but that, that is very much stuck, you know, do we like fascist architecture? Who would, you know, who would put their hand up and say, really, Mussolini was the greatest sponsor of architecture? We don't like doing that, do we? But that, that's, the, that's the, 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 the drama of aesthetics. It really gets to you. I mean, you, you see things that you think, the, the things, beauty or, or, or not, beautiful or not, they're, they're, they're bad. Yeah. And, and that, to me, is the power of this objectivity of beauty. 
It is not something in your own head. It is actually something inherent in the... The, the object has meaning. And fascist art has meaning. It's about fascism. And, and if you go back to Ruskin, I mean, Ruskin in Venice is absolutely fascinating. Ruskin loathed any Palladium buildings in Venice. He went round and cursing these buildings. Most of us think they're beautiful. But he, lo he wanted Gothic, he wanted Gothic, he wanted Gothic. And he thought anything to do with Palladio was, was, was an outrage. I mean, it's worth going round with the stones of Venice. Going round Venice is the most fascinating thing to do because you, you, you begin to see his point. But also, he, in later life, he then walks around London cursing all the Gothic buildings that have been <laughs> yeah. built inspired by his theories. So and, let's and, come back and, to and, and, and the wonderful railways. Yeah. No, I, do, I, do take, I do take that point, Simon, that in the face of something beautiful, sometimes it's irresistible that you have no choice but to accept the beautiful, regardless of who makes it. So mm, Gill, I think, is a great example because even how, however horrendous you think Gill is, and he, of course, is horrendous, we, we walked into this building, which the facade of which is covered by Gill engravings. Most of us, I mean, I was typing up my notes in Gil, a Gill typeface. We live in Gill's work, in Gill's beauty, and we don't have any choice. Or, or I mean, you could choose a different font, but the beauty of that sounds Sarah Font is irresistible, it seems to me. I agree. R Ruskin was also, though, I mean, in some ways, it seems, I mean, he's not always hugely consistent. He also saw nature as at the absolute heart of this, that there was no such thing as beauty that was not in some way um, natural. And, you know, we are, as you know, as your choices of your wow moments show, mm. um, w uh, you know, it's, <clears throat> we find the idea of the beauty of nature absolutely irresistible. But it's a very modern concept, isn't it? And that slightly ruins it for me because I have this awful historian's habit of looking at a beautiful vista and feeling or feeling that I feel something, mm. thinking I feel something, and then thinking, but what would I have done if I'd been born 200 years earlier? Did the romantics tell me to feel this way, or <laughs> yes. am I genuinely really feeling is. this way? Well, is so, this all Wordsworth's fault? So, 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 I'm out yeah. in cold in North Wales. Everything's Wales yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the great thing, I mean, Ruskin discovered he was a, uh, an aesthete when he was six years, years old, walking by Derwent Water with his, his nanny, and he falls off the pushchair, bangs his head on a tree, comes to, sees the, the formation of the roots around the tree and Derwent Water in the background, and knows that's beautiful. From that moment onward, he's going to be an aesthete. But, but, but the, the, the whole movement of which he was a part, as Mary says, was, was to turn the terror of high places. I mean, the, 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 people were petrified of these, these <laughs> yeah. mountains. It's just something beautiful. Yes. And that, to me, and, that was a real and, achievement. Yeah. Uh, when, I mean, you were chair of the National Trust, and its full title is for historic something or other and places of natural, natural beauty. beauty. Yes. Mm. I mean, and what you choose is always these things that, you know, the Greeks and Romans would have hated. Mm. You know, mm. mountains, we think they're beautiful, <laughs> but actually, for anybody in the ancient world, they were terribly inconvenient, dangerous, and got in the way. And it's quite, it's quite <laughs> shocking, you know, those old texts. I mean, just, Samuel Johnson describes the mountains, the Grampian Highlands, mm. as carbuncles yes. and warts on the yeah. face of the earth. Mm. And it's quite shocking, his kind of his instinctual dislike of nature, and it seems very alien. But that's the power of of what the romantics achieved. But, I find that such an alien concept. Yeah, well, me too, as a grimy Londoner. Look at my shoes. I mean, I'm not someone well, who's be, be, beautiful. I'm not going to be good <laughs> on a mountain. But, I, I, but the romantics were also interested in urban landscapes. Don't forget, Wordsworth mm. writes about standing on Westminster Bridge. Earth is not anything more lovely. You know, he's actually talking about pollution. He's talking about fumes. I feel, and to Quincy's wandering around the labyrinthine streets of London and finding it this delirious experience. There's an urban beauty yeah. too, and that's romantic yeah. as, as much as a land. Uh, that pollution, we, we, we don't get, we don't get impressionism. <laughs> <so. Yes. laughs> I am going to take us to somebody else who also wears lovely shoes. <laughs> because the truth is, when we talk about beauty, we are actually very often referring to people. And for centuries, artists and sculptors have given us very idealised representations of the female form and of the heroic masculine physique. Uh, the fashion industry relies on selling us images of perfection and the cosmetics industry is booming. Something else that's booming, though, is the drag scene. So, to explore ideals of female beauty and gender, I've been to meet Ireland's most famous drag queen and activist, Rory O'Neill, better known as Panty Bliss. I look real pretty, right? You do. OK. We can start. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. 
This is my way of saying I don't give a crap because this is not how I'm supposed to look. People always say, when do you feel like you become, you know, pantry or whatever? Um, and the, the two things for me is nails, because it makes you use your hands slightly differently. And that you know, then becomes very conscious. And, and heels is the other thing, because it also transforms how you walk, how you stand, and how, you know, pathetic you are. <laughs> because once you have heels, you know, you're kind of attacked. And the corsetry and all that stuff. Because I, I jokingly say, you know, I'm so glamorous, I'm practically disabled. What do you feel about sort of hardcore feminists who object to what they see as exploiting a particularly pernicious version of femininity? Big boobs, big buttocks, mm -hmm. flancy hair yeah. and red lips. You know, all the reasons why I, why I choose to look like... Exactly, yeah. Well, but, well because you, you feel like oh, that was pushed on you, whereas I felt, feel that that stuff was, you know, kept away from me. And, you know, you want all the stuff that you want. Our culture decided long ago that women would be the peacocks. And then we gave women what I call, the, you know, the tools of peacockery. You know, the powder and the paint and the corsetry and the brass to manage your unruly breasts. You know, all those things. And that would be fine, but then... Our society insisted that women use them, whether they want to or not. Of course, all of this stuff can be fun, but as every woman knows, they can also be time-consuming, uncomfortable, expensive, you know, and sometimes painful. And society really is, is kind of forcing women into peacockery yeah. and then blaming them for yes. being peacocks. Yeah. And yet it takes a real effort to do what I do. Which yeah. is to say, stuff it, you know? Yeah. Because this is a look. People accuse you of not caring, but of course I know that you do care. You, you've thoughtfully put this together. We all decide how we face the world. Yes. And the idea that somehow we just kind of, in absence of mind, kind of <laughs> sort of forgot to put our makeup yeah. on. Yeah. In a way, it's, it's the kind of mirror image of what well, you're doing. Exactly it is. My God, we're sisters here. Because... Because the culture basically says to women, you have to use these things, even though they're uncomfortable and all that. And, and if a woman decides, well, actually, I don't want to have to go to all that bother. I would just like to you know, feel you know, easy or whatever. Well, then the culture looks at her with suspicion. She is either lazy or slovenly or obstinate and, and probably a lesbian, you know, and maybe all four. Yeah. <laughs> but, now, but it's interesting. Now, why did you make your decisions? Because, I mean, I know some of the obvious answers, but is there something to do with intellectualism, too? Where you were consciously, you know, consciously sort of signaling that my brain is more interesting than my uh, corporal being. I um, I used to wear makeup until I was in my twenties, mm -hmm. uh, and I enjoyed it, and it was mm -hmm. fun, and I spent too much money on it. And yeah. I think I began to feel trapped by it. Yes. You know that I'd got to the point of thinking, oh God, I haven't got my mascara on, I can't go out, mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, oh, that's that's no good. And, like, was it a damaging conversion and then one day you decided that's it? Or it was, like, you know, becoming vegetarian and then vegan? And that's right. It was, yeah. I, was, I was on the trajectory to full-blown fashion veganism, <laughs> really. <laughs> I now feel that I am who I look like yes. rather than not being who I look like. But that's the very core of it because you felt that it was, you know, hiding you from the world, whereas I felt that it, I felt that it has revealed me to the world. I, you know, like I can see myself over there, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, my hair, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, these things were always kept away from us boys. And, and I threw off the shame of liking them long ago. Simon, ever been tempted? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was once. I mean, we had to go to a fancy dress party in which you had to go dressed as the opposite. And so I had to go as a woman and my wife as a man. And um, terrific palaver went into the makeup and the dress and everything. I did rather like it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I actually, ever since then, I thought men's clothes are basically just uncomfortable and, and boring. And women have such fun. And I can absolutely see that. It was a wonderful clip there. So you're with Panty. I'm, um. with Panty, I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> Some of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you too, David. <laughs> I, I've always sort of envied the... Um, capacity women have to express themselves with clothes. I think the, prob the problem is is that men who want to express themselves with clothes aren't allowed to because mm. of prescribed yeah. gender roles, and women who don't really want to are expected to. So the problem is this, this 
these rigid gender mm. gender codes. So um, I think everyone's a bit jealous of everybody else. You're both quite dapper, though. I don't see why you should be so troubled. You're, I mean, and also, but you have no idea what that you're wearing. That's in, yeah, that's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. I don't know what's in your wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, do, I think you have reason to be jealous. I think yeah. I think there are lots of... I think Panty's entirely right that um, women are subject to scrutiny in particular ways and we all know the history of corsets mm. and panniers cutting into hips and there is a tyranny about fashion ideals. I think that's absolutely true. But it's also the case I wake up in the morning and I think, my God, I have this array of colour, of texture, of style available to me too and that is a gift as well as a burden. But, and, uh, to, to explain to us, in, in, in the 18th century men dressed, if anything, more glamorously than women. In the 17th century certainly did. Mm. Uh, Beau Brummel, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the Regency period, said, all wrong, we should wear black with, with, a, with, a, with a, a white um, ruff there and we should wash every day, we should be very neat, very clean and very smart and we should not attempt to intrude upon the beautiful space of women. And it's been like that ever since. Why? Well, I think set yourselves free, chaps. And I'm, <laughs> Helen, the makeup artist, will, I'm sure, ha be happy to oblige. She did a great job okay. with me today. <laughs> but you, you can see exactly that moment in art. If you go to the National Portrait Gallery mm. yep. and you walk yeah. through the 17th, 18th century mm. galleries, you can see the flamboyance, the fun men had with mm. their clothes, with their makeup, mm. with their wigs. And then you can watch as you come into the 19th century that men's fashion and men's appearance goes into, almost mm. goes into mourning. Yeah. It becomes you, yeah. black and staid and about respectability. And look at us now, look at us yeah. now. But that's, that is absolutely true when you walk through those galleries that those men in those portraits are in stater colours. But the women that you're fantasising about in those images, in their amazing costumes, have also been dressed often by the artists. And what we're talking about and what Panty's talking about is a, a relatively new culture where women are presenting themselves in the clothes that they want to wear. And it, it was interesting that Panty used the word peacocks yeah. for yes. women yes. because the peacock is the, the male, male of the species. Yeah. But you mentioning the portrait gallery, David, I mean, I kind of wondered whether we don't overemphasise our version of modern stereotypes about how uh, men and women should look. Because, actually, there have always been stereotypes about how men and women should look, and they've been, just as we say, they've been imprisoning mm. and they have been liberating in some ways. I mean, if you, if you go back in history, you don't find a time, you know, OK, it's before Instagram uh, and it's before social media, so fewer people see you. But it's not as if it was a... There's never been a free-for-all about how you present yourself to the world. No, I think that's, that's never existed. Well, and also, in portraits, a lot of the time, people are presenting themselves in their Sunday best or they're presenting themselves with objects that includes clothes that say who they are and what their status in the world is. So the, the portrait, in some ways, is an inaccurate uh, keyhole with which to look people's, at people's relationship with clothes. Uh, or, I mean, I, I know that Shahida's got a certain affection for Kim Kardashian. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, um, I mean, that's a confession equal to Simon's alarming confession <laughs> earlier. Um, <laughs> I sort of think, I think she's abhorrent in lots of ways, of course. I think that she's, the, the culture of self absorption and the the luxury goods that she's interested in accumulating and the, the kind of, the the body consciousness, all of those things I'm pretty sure have a terrible effect on the mental health of young women particularly. But I also think, I look at her, and I don't, and I suspect lots of people feel the same, that she has the most magnificently symmetrical face, that she's this extraordinary, she's a Cleopatra, right? And I find her really difficult not to gaze at her. I mean, that's why she's on the front of all those magazines. But that says something about beauty too, that it is an absolute seduction. It doesn't matter how abhorrent Kim Kardashian is, that face will launch a thousand ships and sell a million magazines. But if you flipped it and you said, so let's not think about, about these ideals of beauty, however they have been manifested and pressed on us, whether it's by a, a painter or a photoshopper, and we said, OK, so what do we think about ugliness in this? Is it easier or more difficult to talk about uh, ugly people? I mean, people, you know, a. a. Gill famously said of me that I was completely ugly. I don't want any reassurance now, mm. but... Um, yeah. but um, <laughs> so Come, please. must. A little, okay. little okay. A little, OK, <laughs> just a little. But, you know, what do we think... You know, what is, what is it to be ugly? 
Do we and do we have a way of talking but, about but that? But it, 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 the thing is so difficult. It just changes all the time. I mean, I can remember when, when you know, when I was when I was a teenager and, and, and people dressed up, you know, like Twiggy with great eyes and hairs part up on their head, and they look they look amazingly sexy then. They're, they now look ridiculous. Now, yeah. what has happened that they did look sexy and they now look ridiculous? I just genuinely don't know. It's, it's to do with fashion and style and all these things. But for some reason, our eye changes over time and we see people differently. And it's not them, they're just the same wonderful person. But there's something in, in, in the eye. It requires a fashion to be changing. And one thing I baffled me about women's fashion, it's got to change every year. But it, but it changes so radically that we can regard something as ugly, which we used to regard as beautiful. It baffles me. I, I, I thought about this a lot because I teach young people, I write about dress and I think about you know, being in this world and being self-conscious. Being a woman and the ways that we're vigilant about the ways that we're seen and we're scrutinised, we're always tugging down our hems or pulling up our bra strap. There's a kind of self-conscious that women bear in the world. But I also think about the insidious ways that Instagram and social media work. And then sometimes I think, actually, we live in a world where people have never looked more different, mm. partly because there are so many different ways of dressing up, mm. but also because the, 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 the social media exposes us to a greater variety of features, both ethnic yeah. and... and I just feel like there's also a culture in which people have never looked more different and we're becoming increasing... We're widening our palette of yeah. what beauty yeah, can be. The dressing up box has got bigger and bigger. Yeah. It's become yeah. global. Every culture, every look is, is in there. And in some ways, it's, it's not a surprise we're confused because we've never had this many options. Except for men. Why do the it, Chinese all... Communist Party dress like us? <laughs> <laughs> They could only answer for that themselves. Okay. I dare not speak for that authority. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, you're absolutely right. You know, male politicians the world over. No, not, not entirely. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you talk to male politicians, what they'll say, and they will use this word always, they'll call it a uniform. Mm. I mean, if, yeah. if you watch how politicians dress in the past sort of 10, 15 years, even ties can't pattern that. Mm. Ties are a single block of colour. Yes, it's becoming more but and more state because any statement can be unintentionally interpreted, and they are but so frightened yeah. and it's of not making about any that. statement Absolutely with their right, yes. And we never think about it in terms of beauty. No, no. We, we never say, is Jeremy Corbyn more beautiful than, um, you know, name anybody? Donald Trump, so you know, it is, it, is, it is not a word that we use in those contexts about men, whereas we, we could plausibly make that have a discussion about, you know, Hillary Clinton versus Angela Merkel. Well, that, that's Panty's point, isn't it, about how, when she asked you, uh, is it a, an intellectual question for you, how you appear, that for women, the, the world is so unequal to us that we have to face the injustice of this unequal world, that it, we can't afford to be allowed to be seen, to be dabbling in something as superficial as fashion. We have to present ourselves as... You know, as as much like the men as possible, often it seems. And if we do dare to wear leopard print shoes like a certain politician, or th then we we incur wrath. And that seems to me so also uh, an injustice yeah. and also unfair. That the, the the playing field is not level. I mean, for I, I think Panty's you know essentially right about. Um, the tyranny of fashion, but I'm afraid I'm going to take us away in a rather different direction from Panty now, because there's a question for me also about how we respond or think <coughs> we should respond to beauty of different kinds. Now, there's a, a collection of essays by the 20th century Japanese philosopher Soetsu Yanagi uh, celebrating the beauty of humble domestic objects. But I think that not many of us go into raptures about our pottery, teacups, our everyday fragments, even if we are impressed by their good design and praise their good design. But in, in front of paintings, or actually maybe particularly when listening to music, beautiful music, we're kind of expected to have that tingle down the spine effect. Now, I sometimes find that quite oppressive. I mean, how, you know, David, do you cry when you're, when one of the things, you know, <laughs> pe that divides people is, you know, do you go in front of a painting or go to listen to a concert? Do you find yourself crying? 
the the right pieces of music, things like Jerusalem, will have me crying instantly and involuntarily. I found it much, very different with fine art, with paintings. I'm much more, it's a much more cognitive process. But music, music has a capacity mm. that I think no other art form has to just make you emote, just have, I mean, we say, you know, tingle down the spine, hairs at the back of the neck, because it is physical. And I think music does that more directly than any other art form. Drama, drama can. I mean, a, a great play can move you to tears. But you still have to be thinking about the resonance and the, the relevance of what mm. the, the play is delivering. You, 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 you could hear You could hear music <laughs> in a language that you don't understand. Yeah. I agree, and, I agree. No, I agree. Yeah. But there is, nevertheless, this kind of a culture which is wonderfully represented by that sort of also probably mythical Stondahl syndrome which people are supposed to feel and get or get attacked by in Florence because you know you're looking at these beautiful paintings and you get heart palpitations and you sweat and you know you sometimes have to be hospitalized and there was a, a case reported I think a week ago of someone who was standing in front of Botticelli's birth of Venus and had a heart attack um, and this was taken generally poor guy how I many he survived but he was taken generally <laughs> <laughs> as a, an absolutely extreme and slightly, um, um, uh, you know, approved reaction. It was to a work of art. And, you know, I think there's a, there is a bit of a tyranny in all this, and we've been talking about tyranny in other senses, to how we should respond. You know, you're actually a Philistine if you go into a gallery and you don't have that kind of... <sighs> no, heavy breathing response. Well, it's about snobbery. And that's a word I thought we would have used. Yeah. 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 There is mean, an extent that if you don't get this, then you are a Philistine. You, if you aren't having this involuntary reaction, mm. you don't get it, and this isn't for you, and you aren't clever enough mm. to get it. <laughs> and I think that, that snobbery yeah. in art and snobbery in standards of beauty, I think that there, there I, is always a, a vein of snobbery. But that, that's, that's because it was, it, was, it was basically seized by professional artists or professional museum curators. I mean, I, I, going back to, to your introduction, uh, a, a pot by Bernard Leach is regarded as, as, as a work of supreme craftsmanship. Uh, had it been put in the Tate Gallery at some point and put under the care and custodianship of the wines of the Tate and told you that it's a work of art, it would change its character slightly. It would in the interest, in, 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 in the view of the artist. The, the, the man who took the, the ice cream van into the Tate and said it's a work of art. I mean, he, he was conning them, but they weren't sure. Because they're yeah. terribly aware they were on they were on they were on parade. I think, I is think it a work are. of art or not? It, 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 it's it's the, it's the, it's this was a professionalism that's a problem. But, but isn't there a difference here between? I mean, on on the one hand, what what I was just slightly complaining about that there is, you know, a, there is a a real kind of assumption that if you know if you're a proper art appreciator, you know when to cry and you and you appreciate beauty and what you're looking at is beauty, mm. um, and, and that's quite oppressive. But you go into the professional homes of art historians and critics, um, museum curators, museum dealers, art dealers, and the one thing they're never talking about is beauty. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about... I think we're talking about the pretensions of the art scene and the performativity of our responses. And that's something to do with the fact that I think the experience of beauty actually is often physiological. I know that when I... Music, often, but paintings too, or even a poem, I, I know I get... My breath might get more shallow. I get sh a, a tingle around my shoulders. But I was thinking about Duchamp, about Duchamp's urinal, the fountain. Which I think it's hard to see that. I mean, I have to say... I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for your um, a pee on a praise to it as an art of as an object of beauty, but it's, I find it quite hard to see um, Duchamp's urinal as something I would put into the category of beauty. Well, I, I'll tell you what. It I, wasn't a pee on a praise; it was a pee on something well, else. Well, it was a pee on a pee. A pee on of other p words, maybe as well. Um, but yeah, but he, he, when he, of course, it was a. I mean, that's a, the, the piece for lots of people. It's a joke, and it, and I think it was supposed to be a joke in lots mm. of ways. But I remember Alfred Stieglitz took the photograph of mm. it, right? Because we lost the original Uriah, and we have a reproduction of it in the Tate Modern. But Stieglitz said of it, "Everybody who sees this thinks it is beautiful." And I I remember teaching it a couple of weeks ago to my art history students, and they were they were very they were very sno snobby about it. And then we went to the Tate Modern to see the replica, and it's in that glass box, and you see it through the corridor. And they walked in, and this hush descended, and they looked at it. And it's actually this urinal, if you've seen it, it's much smaller than 
urinals, I think, in <laughs> We don't toilet. know, though, Shadi. <laughs> and it's tipped on its side, and it's painted in this porcelain, and it's extremely delicate. And Stieglitz said of it that it looks like a Buddha or a veiled woman. And actually, when you see it in the Tate Modern like that, it does have something beautiful about but, it. But, I contest, Mary. But didn't... <laughs> You know, didn't many artists of the 20th century think if they weren't actually just jacking in, sorry, another unfortunate <laughs> phrase, jacking in the, the, the kind of particular <laughs> version of, of beauty, they, they were at least redefining yes. it yes. so differently yes. that, um, that it was no longer about that kind of tingle. It was about the beauty of line or the beauty of proportion or whatever. And the well, power that, of shock, yeah, I mean, the, the yeah. power of having a, re a reaction that is not a reaction yeah. to beauty, but art can, art can speak to you in other ways. People rarely call Picasso, but Picasso's yeah. painting is beautiful. Mm. Yeah. They're no. stunning and wonderful and powerful and visceral and many other adjectives, but you re it's hard to stand in front of La Demoiselle and go, <laughs> that's, that's beauty. Yeah. That's that's beautiful. No, you don't. You don't no. think that's beautiful. <laughs> but go, if you go back to Yanagi's thing about about the beauty of of is it everyday things, um, I mean, he's he's so powerful in describing these works of craftsmanship, and to him, he goes right back to Ruskin. I mean, the point about the things in his museum is that they were made by hand, out of natural materials, by craftsmanship, trying to do something useful, and to him, that's the highest form of art. And he finds it very beautiful. I find this incontrovertible argument. But, I just, yeah. I'm just thank, thank God they aren't in the hands of the Tate Gallery. I mean, they'd be turned into works of art, and they'd be smashed. They'd be more valuable if they were smashed than if they weren't smashed. I, I feel totally sympathetic to that, Simon. But then I look at that teapot on the cover of that book, mm. and I've seen it down the road in a hipster ceramic shop with that earthenware glaze, mm. and I think about how the artisanal mm. and the homemade has been co-opted by. Hipster culture and by capitalism. What's wrong with that? It's What's all, wrong with that? I, I feel like it doesn't have the mm. same. Uh, you know, he's, he, he's privileging something homemade and local mm. and special and unique. And now I look at those objects and I think they're expensive and they're in these hipster shops and they're part of an aesthetic that everybody. I know 50 people with that with that teapot, and I feel like it's slightly been spoiled by. But maybe I think you're no, being no. a snob now. Yeah. You're, 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 maybe. Just because there's a lot of them. I like the urinal. Yes. Yes. That That's right. You can't say. Shai. Lots of them. Yes. <laughs> you, tea in that. Yes. you can't say that because there's a lot of them. They're not. Beautiful, no. but I'm afraid we're going to have to <laughs> leave this conversation. And you know, what I was going to come on to is the beauty vacuum in modern culture for another time, <laughs> because I have to say now thanks very much to my extremely beautiful guests tonight. Uh, excellently dressed David Olashoga, Shida Barry with the great shoes and Simon Jenkins, and I won't talk about... Um, <laughs> <laughs> The tweets we've had about beauty have been absolutely fascinating. Apart from a few paintings and pets, I should say, the vast majority of your choices have actually been landscapes with a very heavy proportion of sunrises and sunsets. But anyway, I'll be back next Friday and I'll be asking whether size matters in art, from statement architecture to tiny miniatures. But to play us out tonight, the perennially popular but frankly unfeminist tale of Beauty and the Beast, a new production by Birmingham Royal Ballet, opens in Southampton at the end of the month before touring around the country. Good night. <laughs>
so unfair. <gasps> Who is that? Sophie's dad. Ew. Ew. Seriously, Mom, I hate you. If you really want to upset me, you got to come up with something new. Better Things. Watch the box set on BBC iPlayer. Continues Thursdays at 10 on BBC Two.